Welcome. This video is on implementing iterators. A uh, previous video described the concept of an iterator and how you use it. What we're looking at now is how you create an iterator type. And this is something that we will be doing with many of the data structures we cover in this class. We're going to start off with a relatively simple data structure, which is the pair. So the goal here is to create an iterator data type for a data structure so that end users can loop through the data structure and represent a location in the data structure. What that means is we need to define a iterator class data type for each data structure that we create. What we're going to do here is first go over what's required to make that happen and then a worked example where we make an iterator for the standard pair class. So first, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to create a new class. I'm going to call it pair underscore iterator and it will need to implement a certain abstract data type, which is a particular kind of iterator. And what we're going to do in this video is implement the forward iterator interface. C++ actually defines a number of different categories of iterators with different capabilities. It's a little bit complicated. We're going to get into that later in the class. We have some time set aside for a deeper dive into iterators. But for right now, we're just going to focus on the simplest kind of iterator, which is the forward iterator. So I'm, now I'm going to go to this web page that defines what operations go into that. Here we are. This is that c++.com official documentation on what a forward iterator is. As I mentioned, there's this complicated uh, hierarchy of different iterator types. We're going to get into that later. But for now, what we want to focus on is this table, which has the essential properties that a class needs to implement in order to be considered a forward iterator. So for the first property is that our class has to be default constructible, copy constructible, copy assignable, and destructible. So you have to be able to construct it with a constructor and the destructor has to work. This is some pretty basic stuff that most classes have to implement. So that's not too out of the ordinary. Our class will need to have the equal, equal, and not equal operators. You have to be able to compare to iterator objects. And that's necessary because of the way that iterator loops work. You start the iterator at the beginning, and then you say, while my iterator is not equal to the end, do stuff. So in order for that equal or not equal comparison to work, we need to overload those operators. The way that you get an element out of an iterator A is to dereference A. So if A is an iterator, star A gives me the element at that location. Therefore, we need to implement the dereference operator. And it has to be possible to assign into an element by dereferencing. Uh, that's in order to make the elements assignable. And then finally, the other operation is that we need to be able to move from one location to the next. And we do that with increment. So if A is an iterator, plus plus A has to work. Also, A plus plus has to work. And plus plus has to work with dereference, which is what that's saying. So those are the operations that we need to implement. OK, let's just recap what we saw on that official documentation. Here's what we need to implement. We need to implement some basic stuff that applies to pretty much every class. The constructor, assignment, and swap have to work. Often the default implementation of those member functions suffice, and we don't really need to write explicit code. And uh, that's going to be the case in this example, and, and usually we don't put a lot of energy into those parts. But what does take some creative thought and uh, design are the comparison operators. So two of our iterators have to be comparable with equal, equal, and not equal. The dereference operator has to take an iterator that's at a location and give you the element at that location. So this needs to know about how we find elements within a data structure that contains multiple elements. And the increment operator, which needs to move us from one location in a data structure to the next, and that might include going from a valid location to past the end, because an iterator can be at a valid location or past the end. So that's what we need to implement. And we're going to work out an example of implementing an iterator for the pair data structure. So recall pair is a built-in data structure that has two elements, first and second. And what I want to do is create an iterator class that works for standard pair so that we can loop through a standard pair using iterators. There's a little bit of design problem solving to do here. There's multiple ways of going about this in terms of the data members that the pair iterator class will have and how we implement those data members. Um, I'm going to pick one. Here's one way of implementing it, which is that the data members are two things. First, the pair we're iterating through. So in order for a pair iterator to loop through the elements of a pair, it has to know which pair we're talking about. 
So it's going to have one data member for that, a reference to a pair that we're looping through. And then the other thing is where within the pair we are. And I'm going to use an index for that information with the normal convention that index zero is the first element, index one is the second element, and the past the end concept will be at index two because pairs always have exactly two elements. So the legal indices are zero and one, and two would be past the end. I'll mention there's other ways of doing this. This would be a place where you could use an enumerated type, an enum. You could have an enum with values like at first, at second, past end. That would be another way of programming this, but I'm just gonna pick something that's relatively simple and run with it. So what we need to do now is implement those operations, equal, not equal, dereference, and plus plus based on this design here. And I'm gonna insist on one restriction in my code here. This pair iterator won't work on any kind of pair. It will only work on a pair where the first and second elements have the same data type. And that's kind of implied by the forward iterator abstract data type we were looking at. Implicit in those definitions are that in an iterator, every element that you iterate through has to be the same data type because that's how arrays and likewise similar data structures work. So our iterator will only work when the first and second element have the same data type. It's a little bit of a restriction. So that, you know it will work for something like standard pair of int comma int our iterator would not work if you had a pair of int comma string. Uh, so in general, the kind of pairs that will work with our iterator would be a standard pair of t comma t, where t is the same data type in both positions. So here's the declaration of my class and the data types in the constructor. It's a template class type name t. t is the data type of both the first and second element of the pair. It's called class pair iterator. And the data members are down here in the private section. And just like I discussed a moment ago, I've got two of them. One is a reference to a pair of t comma t. Note the ampersand, that means that's a reference, kind of like a pointer, but safer. That's the pair that we're looping through. And then index is which of the locations we're at, and that's going to be zero for the first, one for the second, two for past the end. I'm using size t because that's the most appropriate integer data type for the size of an array or an index into an array. Up here I have this constructor. I'll mention that this constructor will not be used by the users of our class directly. Instead, we will have a begin and end function like we're supposed to, and those begin and end functions will call this constructor. But someone has to be able to create a pair iterator so that it exists. And this is a conventional uh, uh, constructor that takes the two data members, the pair and the index and assigns them. And I do have an assertion in here to check that our invariant is obeyed. We have an invariant that index underscore has to always be zero, one, or two, and no other value. So we confirm that here by checking or asserting that index is less than or equal to two. Size t is an unsigned integer, so we know that index is not negative, but what if someone passed in a larger value like five? That would trigger this assertion. All right, so let's get into the operations. First, comparison. Here we're overloading the equal, equal, and the not equal opera operators. The syntax is always a little weird in C++, but uh, you got to do it. So operator is a keyword that says we're overloading a operator by writing a function, member function. And uh, the way that equal, equal works is it takes two arguments. It's a binary operator. Uh, this function will get called if I compare A equal equal B. So A would be the left operand, B would be the right operand, and the convention is that the this class is the A, the left operand, and then the right operand is passed as an argument. So const pair iterator ampersand RHS, that's the right operand. I'm comparing this to RHS. RHS stands for right-hand side. That's an abbreviation I find uh, readable. And this function needs to return a Boolean because when you compare, you get true or false based on whether they're equal or not. And then here's the logic for how do we tell if one location within a pair is equal to another location within a pair. And the idea is that we're at the same location when the index values are the same. So index zero, index one, those are different, don't count as same location, but index zero and index zero, those are both at the first that's the same location. So it's just, if my index is equal to the right hand sides index, we're equal. We're also overloading the not equal operator, which is the same thing, except it's not equal in the name of the function and also not equal in the return statement. Now let's look at increment. So the idea of increment in an iterator is go from one location to the next. So this function needs to get that idea across of going from one location in a pair to the next. 
there's a little bit of a technical issue here, which is that C++ has pre-increment and post-increment. Pre-increment is like plus plus IT, if IT is an iterator, and post-increment is IT plus plus, and those work a little different. So we have to overload both, unfortunately. Um, we're going to do plus plus IT first because it's simpler. So the way that plus plus IT pre-increment works is first you increment the iterator to the next location, and then the value of this expression is whatever you have after doing that. So here's the syntax for the overload. We have operator plus plus. It's a unary operator because there's no there's only one operand here, so there's no argument there. And we have to return a reference to the iterator after having done the increment. Here's the logic is if index is not two, I increment index. And the thinking here is that my invariant is that index has to always be zero, one, or two. So if I'm at index zero, we increment to one. If I'm at index one, we increment to two. If we're at index two, I don't want to increment to three because three is not a legal index. So if we're at two, we stay stuck at two. If you're at the end of the pair, you stay stuck at the end. So this if statement accomplishes that. And then I have to return a reference to the current iterator and star this does that. It's an idiom in C++. Okay, I'm also obligated to do the post increment it plus plus. And there's a little bit of an ugliness here that the way that you tell the difference between them is that operator plus plus takes an int argument that's never used. It's a little weird. This is kind of a flaw in C++'s operator overloading syntax design, but is what it is. And what post increment does, it plus plus, is that you save the value of the iterator before incrementing it, then do the increment, and then the value of this expression that we return has to be that state of the iterator before doing the increment. It's a little complicated. So there's a pattern for this, which is that we save a copy of this. So pair iterator temp equals star this. That makes a copy of the current iterator before doing any incrementing. Then I do pre-increment plus plus star this. That calls this operator up here. This is an example of the don't repeat yourself principle, DRY. I don't want to copy paste this code. Instead, I want to call it to avoid duplicating uh, effort. So uh, this plus plus star this calls the first version of the operator overload. And then I return temp, which is the copy of the iterator uh, before it got incremented. This is a little bit of, again, a technical detail, but uh, it's something you've got to do. Often the, this post increment operator just looks exactly like this. OK. Uh, next, the dereference operator, and the purpose of this is that I have an iterator and I want to find the element at that location. This function embodies the concept of going from an iterator to the element at the location of that iterator. So we're overloading the star operator. It's a unary operator because you just do it like this, star it. There's only one operand, and it needs to re return a reference to a t. Recall that t is the template parameter for the data type of one element of our pair. So I'm returning a reference to an element of the pair by following the location of an iterator. And I say if, OK, I mean, here's my convention. I had it in my slide. Here's where this shows up in the code. If index is 0, return the first pair element. Otherwise, index should be 1, return the second pair now element. Now, this only works if index is currently 0 or 1. And that's logically consistent, because there's only two valid locations in a pair, the first and the second. If we're past the end, at index two, you're not allowed to dereference the iterator. And this assertion checks that. There's an invariant here. We're only allowed to dereference if we're at index zero or one. Finally, I need to provide some begin and end functions. What I should really do is make these member functions of std pair. But the problem is std pair is a built-in class. It's in the C++ standard library. I'm not allowed to edit it. So just as a workaround to finish this example, I'm going to make these top level functions that are not in the class. So it'd be better if these were in the pair class, but I can't do that. So this is a template function, and it takes a pair, p, and returns a iterator at the begin location. Let's go back and review how the constructor works. You give it a pair to iterate through and an index of where we are. And the index has to be 0, 1, or 2. So to get an iterator at the beginning, I return a pair iterator using the same pair p starting at index 0. And to get an iterator that's past the end, I construct a pair iterator with the same pair p, but at index number 2, because 2 means past the end. Finally, let's see how you would use this. So uh, I want to do a for loop using iterators. So for pair iterator in i, that's declaring a object of my pair iterator type um, i, and it starts at that pair begin function. 
as long as i is not at the pair end function that's calling these two functions, then we do the body of the loop, and that's going to print out dereference i. So dereference i is going to call this code here to extract one of the elements of the pair, and then a space just so they don't run together. And then plus plus i is going to call this pre-increment operator we overloaded here to move to the next index. And this actually works. It works. So what goes on here in this for loop is we start at the first element, print it out, print out the second element, and then it stops. And this is demonstrating the abstraction. You know, a pair doesn't work like an array. Pairs don't have indices. However, we're still able to write a for loop that uses iterators and treats it as if it did kind of have something like an index location. So that's the idea of iterators. We can implement this kind of iterator-based for loop for data types that are not actually arrays.